This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. You know, the first one is such a, a fantastic, all-time great record. Um, a Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. Um, why did you choose that? And when did you first hear it? I think I first heard it about 1965. Um, I was a young teenager. I was very inspired by the Black Civil Rights Movement. And the message of this song is really that, you know, don't give up. Um, the movement is here. We are going to change things. So it really is an anthem that gives hope to all downtrodden people, the hope and possibility of change. Um, I think he wrote it, I understand, in response to the fact that he'd been turned away from a whites only motel when he was on tour. And that was the real driving moment for writing that song. But it does reflect very much his wider experiences of, as a black man and the experience of African-American communities in the 1960s. And to what extent do you think Sam Cooke would be happy that the change, uh, you know, to what extent would he be happy with the changes that followed you know, the release of that song? Well, of course, he would have been overjoyed that um, not long afterwards, the Civil Rights Act was passed and uh, segregation ended in the Deep South. You know, the segregation of buses, trains, beaches and other public facilities was officially ended and made illegal. And of course, also the tactic of white supremacists in the Deep South to block black people from registering to vote, that was also ended. But I guess if he was with us now, he'd also <laughs> be rather horrified that you know there are still grave injustices and Black Lives Matter has shown what um, huge changes are still required, not just on policing of black communities in the United States, but also the way in which the poor black underclass has been locked out of economic prosperity and success. So, you know, there are still battles to fight today. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, in many of these battles, um, many battles for positive social change, you're at the very forefront. And I, I'm looking forward to talking about your incredible career um, once we've talked a bit about music, the second song that you've selected is, an, you know, another classic, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, um, Eva Cassidy. Um, what, why did you choose that? Well, there's been many different versions. And of course, of course um, yeah. Judy Garland made it very popular in The Wizard of Oz. But I think the Eva Cassidy version from the 1990s really nails it as, to me, the, the best version of all. It is so hauntingly beautiful and moving. And again, it is a message of hope, you know, you know, somewhere over the rainbow, uh, we'll be free, you know, um, the dark clouds will pass, um, you know, no tyranny lasts forever. Um, that is the message. And for me, it's given me a lot of personal inspiration when I've been down and, you know, struggling with, you know, so many different human rights issues and dealing with so much suffering on a day to day basis. I've often stopped and listened to that song just to recharge me and give me the resolve to carry on. I've also often sent it to victims of torture and uh, refugees fleeing persecution. And they've all come back to me and said, that song really lifted my spirits. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine that it would, but then again, I can't because, you know, I've never been through anything serious in my life. You know, I'm um, incredibly privileged and I don't know what it's like to suffer uh, you know, uh, compared to any of any of these type type of issues that, that you deal with and, and the suffering that the, um, that many people around the world go through. So, and and I wanted to kind of go back to your, the song that you were uh, you chosen by M people, but um, I uh, I wanted to move ahead to John Lennon's Imagine with with these um, with these songs songs like Imagine songs like Somewhere Over the Rainbow, you get um, transported 
to to a place like a kind of utopia you're imagining a world that you know kind of free of any problems do you think do you think that we'll i mean we'll never be able to end suffering will we i mean your life is dedicated to it seems to to trying to end suffering as much as possible do you think that these worlds envisaged by people like john lennon um and and in songs like somewhere over the rainbow do you think such a place is possible well of course we will probably never have a perfect world but we can certainly have a better one hmm. and one of my mottos is don't accept the world as it is dream of what the world could be and then help make it happen in my lifetime millions of people have made it happen uh, apartheid in south africa is now history the franco and pinochet fascist regimes respectively in spain and chile are now history um, lgbt plus people people with disabilities women and black people they are all much better off today than they were 50 years ago when i began still not perfect by a long shot but change can happen does happen and it happens because people get up and say i've had enough i'm not putting up with this anymore i think those songs just help in capture that spirit of resistance and rebellion of protest of a commitment to change things for the better yeah they absolutely do were you were you a fan of um john lennon's in general uh, or do you just particularly like that that record I was a teenager in the 1960s, so the Beatles were very much, um, you know, part of my growing up. Um, but I particularly way, liked the way John Lennon, after the Beatles, became much more political and human rights focused. So this song, Imagine, is just one of, of, of many that he's written, um, which challenge injustice and seek to... Um, uplift people so he song power to the people mm. um uh sunday bloody sunday about the war in ireland um these are all different songs which are commentaries are uh, by lennon on social issues of the day and by and large i pretty much agree with him and felt that he was nailing these issues in a way that perhaps reached people that ordinary politics wouldn't yeah, he. I mean, he was looked to and still is as, as, a, as a mythical figure. Obviously, no human being is perfect. Um, you know, some some reach a, a state of or some have kind of a more untarnished records. Lennon, obviously, you know, I'm a Beatles obsessive. I love John Lennon's voice, everything about him. Uh, from what I know, you know, he was quite a problematic character in some ways. He wasn't by no means a perfect um, person. Uh, but as you've just highlighted, he campaigned for human rights. He did so He did so much to try and change the world in a good way. Um, do you think that if he had tripped up in some way in today's more kind of public world, do you think people even with his kind of status would be open uh, to the sort of, you know, I, I feel like, there's there's a lot more um, public criticism of, of figures and a lot more kind of piling on when someone gets something wrong. You know, like, for example, when I think he had was in his last weekend and he was drunk in a bar in the Troubadour in L.A. and he, he got in a big fist fight, you know, would 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 bad incidents. Do we let bad incidents um, kind of overpower the good sides of people too much in today's society? But I think it's right we challenge people who do or say bad things. Um, sure. You know, we shouldn't give a free pass to prejudice or intolerance of any form. But I think we also need to hold out the hand of forgiveness, you know, the possibility of redemption. Um, what I don't like about the current atmosphere is it's almost one strike and you're out. So yeah. if someone makes one mistake, um, despite perhaps a un previously unblemished career. And even if they apologize most sincerely, they are hounded and forced out of public life in some cases. And I think that's very, very wrong. You know, um, you know, there's been many instances in my life where, for example, homophobic politicians who voted against LGBT plus equality here in Britain, um, 
they they eventually uh, recognized that they were wrong. They apologized, and I now count them as friends and allies. You know, my goal was wow. always to make an enemy into an ally, uh, to not assume that someone who's bad will always be bad, but to hope for the possibility that one day they might be good. That that does seem like the 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 best way to move forward but of course it's so easy to say that if you've not been on the opposing end of some kind of you know tyranny uh, some kind of uh you know injustice injustice that's probably extremely severe in in some cases but it seems like the sort of build bridges not walls um ethos is is slightly uh out of fashion at the moment. Uh, are you a big user and uh, supporter of social media? Do you like social media? I, I use it. I don't like it. Um, I don't often look at my Twitter notifications because they're often so toxic. And, you know, I think Twitter is basically very harmful to people's mental health. Mm. Um, I don't want to censor it. But I certainly think that the same legal constraints that apply to speech in person and uh, written word, like the laws of libel and defamation, should apply online as well. And harassment, threats, menaces and online trolling should be made illegal. Uh, it's not because I want to suppress people's points of view. I'm very happy for them to express disagreeable critical views, including of me but not in a way that can damage my and other people's mental and emotional health. That is not free speech. That's an abuse of free speech. So we have to strike a balance. Yeah. I, I don't see the, I don't see there being any validity to this whole, Oh, we're in a crisis of freedom of speech just because we don't want horrendous, you know, racial epithets, uh, horrible abuse that, I mean, essentially, we could get to a point on social media where if you disagreed with someone, you'd put your point across as you would in person. Because some of the stuff being said on social media, you would not, your average person hurling this abuse would not say that in person to anyone. And therein probably lies, lies the problem. But yeah, I mean, you know, people say things to me that I should be killed. They will re rejoice the day I die. I should be castrated. They accuse me of X, Y, Z crimes, all kinds, all fabricated. And some of the actual insults, threats, and lies are very sophisticated. And a lot of people sadly are taken in by them. Um, but, you know, I know that I am trying my best to stand up for people's human rights. I'm following my conscience as best I can. Um, I don't feel guilt or shame. Of course, I'm open to the possibility that I might be wrong. So a reasoned, constructive criticism, I will mm. always listen to, you know, I, I think it's really important that none of us assume that we are right. We should always listen to our critics. And sometimes they have valid points and I try to take them on board. Of course. And I mean, going, going to the song that I kind of just skipped, Search for the Hero by M People, um, is there something in you uh, that gets kind of inspired by, by that song and, and, and the lyrics and, and, and the kind of sentiment behind it? Well, again, it's a song I often uh, send to people uh, to really encourage them to recognize that they have great talents and capacities. Uh, they should search for that hero inside of them and you know, empower themselves. Um, to me, it's a, it's a great song that actually says to people, look, you know, you have the capacity to do important, valuable, significant things. Maybe not world shattering, but important for you, the people around you and your community. So again, it's, it's one of these songs that is really uplifting and motivating. And again, sometimes when I'm down, <laughs> I listen to it to, 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 you know, uplift my own spirits and to just give me a boost of confidence that I can carry on despite all the brickbats. And I tell you, I've had a lot. I mean, I've had um, over 300 violent assaults upon my person, um, over 50 attacks upon my flat, including bricks and bottles through the window, uh, three arson attempts, a bullet through the front door. I've been attacked with fists, 
boots, iron bars, rocks, bricks, bottles. Um, all the nearly all the teeth in my mouth are chipped and cracked from these various assaults. Um, I've lived with post-traumatic stress disorder for a long, long, long time, for 30 years. Um, so being able to listen to songs like Somewhere Over the Rainbow or Search for the Hero Inside, it has given me emotional comfort and given me confidence to carry on. Yeah, I mean, if music uh, serves a purpose, then I mean, what better purpose to serve than that? And what that must be like to go through, like, you know, as I said, I can't honestly cannot even fathom like what one of those incidents would be, let alone so many years of it. What, is this still going on today? Much less so, thankfully, um, but occasionally still. Um, you know, for me, it was like living through the 1980s and 1990s, uh, particularly, but also the early part of this century, it was like living through a low level civil war. You know, I never left my flat without looking over my shoulder, um, without being very conscious of who was around me and what their demeanor was, because I'd have, you know, attacks out of the blue all over the place, you know, at the local shopping center, at a tube station, um, on an intercity train, um, in another city when I was talking uh, to a community group or something. Um, it was it was a frightening, frightening period. And there were times when I thought about giving up. But then I took my inspiration from human rights defenders in countries like Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and Uganda. And I thought, well, if they can put up with the literal threat to their lives and liberty, uh, then surely I can put up with this and carry on. So uh, there's another example where I suppose looking at the experience of others can sometimes usefully put your own experiences in perspective. You know, unlike these people in other countries, I haven't been jailed, I haven't been tortured, I haven't been killed. So I count myself lucky. Well, I mean, if you're able to, to do that, then I think there are many people who, if they went through what you've been through, they would not be counting themselves lucky. So that's an incredibly, uh, you know, unbelievably mature uh, and yeah, I can't fathom how anyone could 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 have that outlook, but it's it's an amazing thing to, and I, it's, I guess it's the same ethos behind some of these songs that you've chosen. Uh, your final selection is uh, "Barber's Adagio for Strings" by William Orbit, and for those people who would like to listen to this, this is the Ferry Corsten remix. Why did you choose this? Well, I love Barber's Adagio, um, but I also love electronic dance music and particular trance music. Um, it must be something in my brain, the way my brain is wired, but trance music just takes me to a totally different level. And, you know, when I need to relax, <laughs> that's quite often, um, I will, you know, lie back in the dark on my bed and listen to trance music for blast. And it will just transport me mm -hmm. to a completely different place mentally and emotionally. And I will emerge from that experience um, relaxed and refreshed. When did you first start listening to that style of music? Oh, way back in the 1980s, I think, when it really first came out, 80s and 90s, a lot. I used to listen to Armin Van Buren um, every Saturday night on KISS FM. Yeah, he's, he's a great artist and still, you know, being played on Radio 1. Yeah. Uh, that, that style of music is, yeah, it does transport you to a different place. Do you still, do you still uh, listen to it today? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and during, you know, this period of the pandemic and lockdown, have you, how big a role has music played in, in getting through it? Well, I've been busier than ever, <laughs> um, partly because lots of, initially anyway, lots of it, big human rights NGOs basically closed down. So in the first few months of the pandemic, um, I had many, 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 many more um, human rights cases to deal with. Um, which put me under a lot of, under a lot of pressure, um, but you know, I've pretty much coped okay. Um, I do everything from home, so <laughs> Zoom conferences and uh, public lectures, um, you know, campaign group meetings via Zoom, uh, you know, radio and TV interviews, the same. Uh, it hasn't impacted me too much. 
Um, but obviously, it'd be good to get back to meeting people physically face to face. So I sort of miss, you know, going out, you know, traveling to the north of England and speaking to a, uh, I don't know, an LGBT plus group or an amnesty group, maybe in the northwest or northeast. Uh, it's great to meet other people and to also not only share my story, but to hear their stories as well. Yeah, yeah, there's no replacement for uh, face to face human interaction, despite the fact obviously Zoom has been so helpful and has kept a lot of people connected. And, you know, there's some Made a lot of money. <laughs> well, yeah, that's for sure. I mean, what do you I mean, what is the statistic? The statistic of billionaires becoming richer by I can't remember what percentage, but essentially the pandemic has not treated billionaires badly. Uh, uh, they've done it very, very well. Billionaires overall have increased their total assets and wealth by billions and billions and more. I mean, it is really shocking to think that while everybody else is suffering, they have made so much. So, you know, Amazon, um, all, the, all the big, big tech companies um, have made a killing. Um, yeah. And, you know, Again, it just makes the case for me that, that, that there should be a wealth tax on those who have profited out of COVID, uh, a wealth tax to help fund the National Health Service, to fund the vaccination program, to provide better facilities, both in the NHS and in care homes as well. I mean, for multi, multi billionaires, you know, some of them have got 100 billion plus in, in, in personal assets for them to be taxed at 20% even, <laughs> that makes hardly a dent on their wealth. Um, and indeed, a wealth tax set at an average rate of uh, 20% on mega millionaires uh, and more, um, that would raise probably at least about 400 billion pounds, which is the cost of the COVID pandemic to the United Kingdom government so far. So that by, by simply taxing them at the rate of 20%, we could clear the COVID debt completely. But people like Amazon and uh, that type of league of, of wealth, they don't really even pay any tax at all, do they? Very, very little tax. They, they find all kinds of loopholes to get around paying tax. And you know, that's another thing. You know, we, should, we should be closing the tax loopholes, um, closing tax havens, all these, those, those two methods are ways by which the very rich can avoid their responsibility to pay for the public services and for the action we urgently need to combat climate change. Um, you know, it seems only fair, if I, if I can paraphrase Spider-Man, with great wealth comes great responsibility. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's very true. I mean, they, sometimes these companies purport to take great levels of responsibility but it seems that it's all kind of a PR exercise uh, from the way I'm interpreting it anyway uh, do you think enough is being done to help those who have been financially devastated by the coronavirus pandemic if I can just add that you know billionaires will often say well we donate to charity but you know <laughs> basic public facilities and things like the health service should not be dependent upon charity Mm. You know, you know, when I go and file my tax return, I don't get a chance to negotiate with the tax authorities about the tax rate. But the big companies do. They're allowed to go to inland revenue and negotiate their levels of tax. Um, it's just so shocking. It's just so corrupt. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's particularly shocking when there are a million people in Britain dependent on food banks and over 2 million children living in poverty. This is just unconscionable in a modern country like Britain, which is the sixth wealthiest nation on earth. We, we mm. shouldn't be tolerating it. You know, we've got to have a fairer society. No one is saying that millionaires and billionaires should be stripped of all their wealth and should walk, allow, walk around semi-naked and starving. <laughs> all we're saying is, Perhaps they should sell one of their great master paintings, one of their private yachts or planes, maybe one of their six mansions. That's all we're saying. It's, mm. it's, a, it's just basic fundamental fairness. 
And or, if they or, were, or just give some cash that's sitting in the bank and doing nothing. Well, yeah. And if they were true patriots, if they really love this country, whatever country they're in, if they really love their country, uh, they would want the economy to bounce back and they'd want to make their contribution. And I, ironically, if the economy bounces back, they will also benefit. So them, <laughs> them, them helping fix the economy by being properly taxed and you know, to, to reboot the economy after this crisis and reboot the public services, that will actually work in their own favor in the long run. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there can be no argument. I think the, ch the charity, uh, the acts of charity and such, such like by people, the people that you're referring to sort of mega billionaires, that it just seems so actually fundamentally quite stingy i know charities i know that sounds a bit uh, ridiculous to call charity stingy but I, you know i sometimes read reports of praising these multi-millionaires and billionaires for sort of raising a hundred grand through the sale of some memorabilia or something and it's just like you've got billions or multi-millions in your account can't you just give a hundred grand you don't need to mm. just you don't need to sell something to get a hundred grand you can just give a hundred grand and also a hundred grand when you're worth several billion. It, it, I don't know. Nothing. It, it just seems a bit weird to congratulate people when, as you say, there are so many people relying on food banks. I mean, the extent, the extent of, uh, of, of the problems in this country compared, you know, there are countries with way worse problems. And yet here we are kind of congratulating people doing this, doing these PR exercises, these charity PR exercises. It's um, yeah. I mean, millions of pe millions of people in the developing world are dying every year from preventable diseases like TB, malaria, HIV, and so on. Um, <laughs> it's unconscionable this is still happening. Nearly 800 million people on this planet woke up this morning with either no safe drinking water or hungry and malnourished. I mean, <laughs> it's just so obvious. And of course, the other big issue is the amount of money the world's countries spend on arms and the military. You know, if just, if, if there is an agreement by the countries of the world to cut their military spending just by 10%, not 50% or anything like that, just 10% cut, and if that money was put into a global fund to tackle poverty, within 20 to 30 years, we could ensure that everybody on this planet had sufficient food, to prevent hunger and malnutrition, safe, clean drinking water, running electricity, basic and secondary education, and preventable health care to stop diseases that are needlessly killing people. That could all be done easily by a mere 10% cut in global military spending. Do you know what, what, what a 10% cut would be? That would be $200,000 million a year, $200,000 million every year. That's 10% of global military spending. Over 20 or 30 years, we could fix all these basic fundamental problems of global poverty. And that would produce not only a fairer world, a more humane world, but also a more secure and stable world. We wouldn't have the crisis of refugees fleeing conflict and poverty and hardship on the scale we have it today if back in their home countries they had a decent standard of living and proper employment i mean it's it's impossible to to argue against what you're saying um i wish i wish i thought it was more likely that uh this suggestion was going to be acted upon i mean I hope I hope it is, but you know, I guess as you get older, as you get older, you realize, and you get more involved in politics and current affairs, you realize the extent to which um, systems are broken and and uh, and corruption is so rife, even in countries where you know, like the UK, US, that, that sort of have reputations of not being as corrupt. Um, I mean as you were saying earlier about change is going to come, there's been a lot of positive change over the last few decades. So hopefully that can, can continue, but it seems like we've got a long way to go. 
it will continue, but only if people say enough is enough. Mm. You know, there has to be that moment when people say, we are not putting up with this anymore. It happened in Britain in 1990 with Margaret Thatcher's poll tax, where she tried to introduce a tax, which was the same for a poor person and a rich person. So a rich person paid the same tax as a poor person. I mean, monstrous. And the people rebelled. You know, people en masse refused to pay the poll tax or delayed payments. Hundreds of thousands protested in the streets. And eventually the government, faced with such overwhelming public opposition, did, did back down and scrapped the poll tax. So there's an example in our relatively recent history of forcing a complete government climb down. More recently, Marcus Rash Rashford has achieved it over the government's refusal to fund um, school, school yeah. meals uh, during the holidays for poor and disadvantaged children. And you, in you know, throughout your life, have, have been at the forefront of standing up and saying enough is enough. And I wanted to spend the, the uh, remainder of this podcast highlighting a few milestones, um, especially for my listenership who aren't familiar with your life. And, you know, I apologize for cherry picking. I think people, including me, you know, I want to read a lot more about um, your incredible life. I already knew a bit before inviting you to come on the show. Um, but I mean, what a life it's been. And, and I mean, what a toll you spoke of the toll that it's taken. Um, so apologies in advance for cherry picking some, um, some sort of, you know, key milestones. But I, I first wanted to ask um, you to tell the story of why you interrupted the Archbishop of Canterbury's Easter sermon in 1998. Well, this was a time when the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. George Carey, was preaching that homosexuality was a sin and that LGBT plus people must repent. Now that was bad enough, but he went one step further. He was actually campaigning to stop gay equality laws. He was saying the law should, in many instances, actively discriminate against LGBT plus people in areas like employment, uh, partnership recognition, the age of consent, and so on. So he was actively supporting discrimination. He had refused to meet anyone from the LGBT plus community for eight years. So in desperation, myself and six other members of the LGBT plus group Outrage went to Canterbury Cathedral on Easter Sunday. Uh, we listened to all the initial sacred parts of the service. We didn't interrupt them. But when he began his sermon, we walked, got up out of our seats in the congregation, walked into the pulpit and held up placards criticizing his support for anti-LGBT plus discrimination. And I delivered a very short sort of alternative sermon while he stood there open mouthed, <laughs> uh, where I just simply said, you know, homophobia is not a Christian value. Discrimination is incompatible with Christ's gospel of love and compassion. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, th true. that didn't last very long because being a big civic occasion uh, televised around the world um, in the front rows of the cathedral were the chief constable of uh, Kent and um, his senior officers. So they got out of their pews and um, marched into the pulpit and uh, then proceeded to arrest us. Um, the upshot was that I was charged under the Ecclesiastical Court Jurisdiction Act of 1860, formerly part of the Brawling Act of 1551, which criminalises any interruption of a minister of religion service. So any, any interruption of a place of worship is deemed to be, quote, indecent behaviour. But I hasten, I did not drop my trousers or do anything actually indecent. But under this law, a protest in a church is deemed to be indecent. Um, I could have been fined £5,000 and sent to prison for six months. But the magistrate accepted that it was a brief, peaceful, quite dignified protest. And so he fined me the huge sum of £18.60. Is his reference to the 1860 Act under which I'd been convicted. Um, the upshot was that um, it did prompt the Archbishop to finally meet with the lesbian and gay Christian movement, which he'd always refused. 
um, he did reduce his advocacy of anti-gay discrimination and other bishops in the church who claimed they weren't aware of what he'd been doing, they spoke out publicly uh, in favor of gay equality. So it was a win, win, win. Wow. I mean, that is uh, quite mind blowing though, given the, you know, society, the society that we live in today, that the Archbishop of Canterbury was campaigning like that as recently as 1998. Yeah. It shows you that, you know, it's not even that long ago that you, the world has changed a hell of a lot in a good way. Um, in quite a relatively short time, you know, but yeah, that that protest was a sort of catalyst or catharsis for some of the changes that have subsequently happened in the church. Where today, although not perfect by a long shot, for sure. uh, the Anglican Communion is much more sympathetic and supportive of LGBT plus communities, and the current Archbishop Justin Welby has made quite a number of pronouncements condemning homophobia. Uh, both homophobic discrimination and hate crime, and even opposing the use of uh, conversion therapy to try and change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. So that's that's big progress. Is that illegal? Isn't that is that that's illegal to use that conversion therapy, or is it not? No, it's not not yet illegal. Um, the Conservative government of Theresa May in 2018 uh, promised that it would be made illegal, but here we are heading for three years later, and it still hasn't happened. It's Why do you still think that awful. is? Do you think it's because of the fact that, I guess, you know, if you weren't being forced into it, you know, if you took the decision that you wanted to do that conversion therapy and it was kind of on you, I mean, but then again, you know, they make taking heroin illegal, so... <laughs> well, look, I think that the issue is um, people who end up having conversion therapy are often very um, vulnerable and emotionally distraught about their sexuality or gender identity, mm. often because of pressure from family, friends, and particularly religious institutions. So it's not really a free choice. Yeah. But the other big issue is it doesn't work. It's a fraud. You know? Yeah. It, it's unethical, it's harmful, and it's ineffective as well. So that's why it should be outlawed. And already there are quite a number of countries around the world who have outlawed it based on the fact that it does cause harm and suffering. And which of the countries, I mean, probably too many to sort of mention off the top of your head, but can you think of some of the countries that have done it and, and what, who, who was the first, you know, which was the first country to do it? I can't remember which was first, but Germany, quite a number of states in Australia and the United States have, mm. have, have banned it. Um, and they've had no problems. You know, they, they, they've, it has worked well and given LGBT plus people the protection that they deserve. Yeah, well, I suppose, I hope it, um, it is only a matter of time. And you said Boris Johnson's government have been quiet on it. They haven't done anything about it. No, they keep on kicking it on grass, saying we have to, um, you know, we have to consult more widely. Well, <laughs> it's very interesting. They are apparently consulting, quote, widely, but none of the organisations who oppose conversion therapy have actually been consulted. So it hasn't been very wide. That They appear to be speaking to those organisations that support LGBT plus conversion therapy, but not those who oppose it. What a, what a stupid thing to do. Mm. Just take one. I mean, it's just such an obvious thing to do, but I guess they can keep the ball rolling because of COVID and things like that um, and claim that it's not high up the agenda. Uh, another milestone that I wanted to highlight was your attempted arrest of President Mugabe. Um, what, you know, why did you attempt to arrest him and how did it go down and, and what happened? Well, I'd received appeals from human rights defenders inside Zimbabwe asking me to do something to help raise public awareness around the world about the scale of human rights abuses in their country. At this time in the late 1990s, what Mugabe was doing to his own people, you know, extrajudicial murders, 
torture, a detention without trial, it was hardly reported outside of Zimbabwe. So I hit on the idea of using international human rights law to try to bring him to justice. Now I knew that um, governments around the world were too cowardly to do anything because previously I'd already drawn attention to the fact that he was violating international human rights law and governments around the world, including the British government, just shrugged their shoulders. So um, I decided to invoke the power of citizen's arrest. Under British law and the law of many countries, ordinary private citizens have the power to arrest someone if they have evidence that they have committed a crime. Now, I had evidence that President Mugabe had authorised the torture of two black journalists in Harare, Zimbabwe, uh, that he had approved and authorised their torture. So that was the legal case against Mugabe under the United Nations Convention Against Torture 1984, which has been incorporated into the domestic law of dozen or even, well over 100 countries around the world. So the first attempt was in London in 1999, when myself and members of the LGBT plus group Outrage ambushed Mugabe's motorcade in central London. Um, we ran in front of it, forcing it to halt. And then I remember going to the left hand rear door, opening it, <laughs> amazingly it was unlocked. And then I placed Mugabe, President Mugabe under arrest and summons the police. When the police arrived, <laughs> They were gobsmacked that we had arrested the president of Zimbabwe. <laughs> um, and we explained the legal basis. You know, we had, we had the legal information that the affidavits, the evidence, uh, but they just knocked that out of our hands. We were arrested and he was given a police escort to go Christmas shopping at Harrods. Now, although we did not succeed, the media coverage worldwide about our attempt did shine a light on the human rights abuses in Zimbabwe. And I can remember getting thousands of messages from people in Zimbabwe, all basically saying the same thing. We thought no one knew. We thought no one cared. Uh, they all said it gave them a huge psychological and emotional boost to know that we at least tried to arrest him and that through our arrest, the media publicity um, drew, drew, shone a spotlight on what he was doing to his own people behind closed doors. Uh, we made, I made a second attempt uh, in Brussels in 2001, where I ended up being beaten unconscious by his bodyguards. Now, that was a pretty horrible experience, I've got to tell you, but it actually was wonderful PR for the campaign against his regime because people said, because this is all tele, this is all caught on TV cameras, broadcast around the world, um, people said, <laughs> if President Mugabe is prepared to have his bodyguards beat unconscious a peaceful protester in the heart of a European capital city, Brussels, in broad daylight, in front of TV crews, just imagine what he's doing to his own people when no one is watching. So that really did help, I think, I think it was one of the most effective things ever in terms of drawing international attention and anger against the abuses of the Mugabe regime. Yeah, and what immense courage it must have taken. And especially after an experience like that, only a year later, you confronted Mike Tyson. Uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't uh, fancy confronting Mike Tyson at the best of times, um, but you confronted him in Memphis in 2002 about his sexism and homophobia. Why did you decide to do that? And do you think his attitude has changed since then? Well, this was the run up to his world title fight against the British boxer Lennox Lewis. And in the months leading up, Tyson had repeatedly used homophobic insults and threats against Lennox Lewis. Um, and I just thought, no one is challenging him. He's getting away with this. You know, I, I've got to do something, you know. Boxing is a big macho sport. You know, it's, it's one of the great bastions of machismo. Um, no one seems willing to take it on. So I thought, I will go to Memphis and I'll try and confront him. 
and challenge him. So I went to Memphis in Tennessee uh, just a few days before the world title fight. Um, I knew that he'd have to be in training in the days before the fight. So I had no idea where he was doing his training, but um, a newspaper report, I scoured all the press and the media, and I found a newspaper report that said he was residing in a particular suburb on the outskirts of Memphis. So then with that information, I then um, scoured all through the telephone directory and uh, other, other sources to find out all the gyms nearby or in the vicinity. I thought he probably chose that area because there's a gym nearby. So I stumbled across the 650 gym and it was quite close to where he was allegedly staying. So I thought, fingers crossed, this might be where he's doing his training and I'll go there and I'll confront him. So uh, on a Sunday morning, I think five days before his world title fight, I went to the 650 gym with a couple of um, local Memphis LGBT activists and uh, we lay in wait. Um, very soon, TV crews started arriving. And I thought, wow, <laughs> they wouldn't be coming here. <laughs> they wouldn't be coming here if something big wasn't going to happen. I mean, surely this is the place where Mike Tyson is coming today. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. Um, certainly, sure enough, a um, uh, while later, Mike Tyson rocks up in his SUV or convoy of SUVs and comes out. And we rush over and confront him holding up placards, you know, condemning his sexism and homophobia. <laughs> I can remember the look on Tyson's face. It was like a mixture of shock and aggression. And indeed, he raised his right fist as if he was about to knock me out and then saw the TV cameras and quickly, hastily withdrew his fist and started protesting. What are you doing? Why are you, why are you attacking me? He seemed like a little, almost like a frightened little kid. Um, he didn't like being challenged. Obviously, no one had challenged him. So um, we had this you know, rather aggressive, you know, backwards and forwards, um, you know, conversation about his homophobia. And he protested that he wasn't being homophobic, that he was, he was just saying these things to Ryle Tyson. And I said to him, look, you know, you're a black boxer. You wouldn't like it if a white boxer riled you by using racist taunts. And that would be totally wrong. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So then he sort of got into a half-baked apology. And I said, well, look, you know, if you really are not homophobic, will you say to the camera that you oppose anti-gay discrimination? And to his great credit, he did. <laughs> I think he's gotta be the first or one of the first macho sports stars, straight macho sports stars to ever do that. Um, so that was a real big, big moment. Um, and it, it had ripples effect throughout boxing and the sporting world. Yeah, because the sporting world is still, you know, homophobia seems pretty rife given the fact that there's, I don't know how many um, gay footballers, for example, in uh, male professional football have come out, but it's literally like nearly zero. I mean, how ridiculous is that in the 21st century? I mean, there are so many things that you have that you have done and I'm sure we'll continue to do. And I'm sorry that we've only had a chance to really hit the tip of the iceberg. Where can people go to find out more about your amazing life and the work that you do? Well, please go to my website, which is petertatchellfoundation.org. There's a, on that site, there's a whole lot of information about our current campaigns, news releases and so on. Uh, in the top right-hand corner, there's a little button which says, join us. It's totally free. Just give us your email address and we will put you on our subscriber list for our free weekly uh, bulletin about LGBT and other human rights issues. So do that. And also, if, if you're feeling generous, uh, we do depend entirely on donations from well-wishers to carry on our work. In the top right-hand corner, there's also a donate button and you can donate a bit of money to help us carry on. But I want to finish by saying that... Um, it's been a great pleasure to join you this evening and thank you so much for ha having me. Um, I think it's thank also important. It's also very important to say that a big thank you to all the millions of people uh, around the world who have done something to push for better human rights for us all. 
most of those people are unknown and unsung, but every single one of them is important and valuable. And I pay tribute to them all. It's very simple. Together, we are stronger. Unite the many to defeat the few. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.